Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this first event in your Distinguished Speakers Program. Today, of course, we hear two of the most respected members of the United States Senate debate Johnson versus Goldwater. Senator Albert Gore, uh, seated here, a Tennessee Democrat on the Committees for Foreign Relations, Finance, and Atomic Energy in the Senate, speaking for President Johnson. Senator Carl Munt, on my right, a North Dakota Republican on the Committees for Foreign Relations. North Dakota. South Dakota. I won that debate. Which gets us into the problem of publicity, but uh, <laughs> from South Dakota, Republican on the Committees for Foreign Relations, Appropriations, and Investigations, speaking for Senator Goldwater. And uh, the procedure that we're going to follow today will be that we will have two uh, opening addresses, one from each senator. Uh, these will take us uh, to approximately 10 minutes to one. And uh, then we will uh, have a brief recess when you will be able to uh, go to your one o'clock classes if you have one o'clock classes. Then we'll have two brief rebuttals and then we will take questions from the floor. So the debate will open now with uh, an address advocating President Johnson's reelection and I have the honor to present Senator Albert Gore. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, faculty members, student body, it is most encouraging to see so many of you here. I do hope that Senator Munt and I will be able partially to justify your attention. We are here to discuss a crucial decision which the American people have the duty and the privilege to make. A decision which is likely to affect the lives of every American citizen, young or old. But more than that, one that will set the pattern of America's position in the world for years to come. Because this indeed is an election in which a clear-cut choice is offered. President Johnson has long been a supporter and firm advocate and is, as president is now a leader of collective security in the free world. Faith in and firm support of uh, the United Nations. Peace through strength, but also through careful negotiation, firm resolve, but consideration also of the points of view of other nations. The President of the United States is the most powerful political leader in the world. He is not only the Commander-in-Chief and the Chief Administrator of our Armed Forces and the Chief Administrator of our government at home. He is the principal architect with the advice and consent of the Senate. Indeed, with the advice and consent of the Senate, he is the architect of our country's foreign policy. The president is also the country's chief legislator. By power of the veto and also the power of initiative and recommendation. So when the American people choose a president, it is a fateful decision. In these times when mankind 
has the power to destroy itself. In this period that is characterized by the rapidity of change, we need most of all a safe president. Safe and sound, courageous and determined. What kind of leader could we, what kind of leadership could we expect and what kind, what caliber of leader could we anticipate of the two men offering and who are now offered by our two great political parties as president? There is little guesswork about the kind of president Lyndon Baines Johnson would make. We have seen him perform during a crucial period of months. Never was a president more burdened than on that fateful day when the assassination brought his succession to the presidency. I was there, not in the closest of contact, but now and then in personal contact. I saw him perform. It was a marvelous demonstration of executive capacity a marvelous demonstration of an understanding of the office of President of the United States, an appreciation of the power and the responsibility of that office. We do not have to guess whether President Johnson will make a good president. He already is a good President of the United States. We do not have to ask ourselves and wonder if he can safely be entrusted with the responsibility and the power of leadership in the international field. For this too he has already demonstrated. Within a very few days, fortunately in some respects because Many leaders of the world came visiting to our country upon the sad occasion of the Kennedy funeral. President Johnson established personal equations with the leaders of the principal nations of the world as well as many leaders of minor nations of the world. And then as commander-in-chief, his mettle has been tested too perhaps deliberately tested by an attack upon our ships in Tonkin Bay. He reacted and reacted quickly, I think fittingly and properly, but in a carefully limited way. So we see what kind of leadership he can provide in the international field. And the relationship of our country with the nations of the world is the overwhelmingly important issue in this campaign. Because upon the manner of leadership that we have in that regard may well determine peace or war. In domestic administration, I can give you a personal estimate of the effectiveness and the successfulness of the Johnson administration or of President Johnson as president. It's been my privilege 
as it has been the privilege of my distinguished opponent in this debate, to serve in Congress during administrations of former President Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy. Without in any way disparaging the superlative qualities and attributes of either of those men, I say to you, it is my considered opinion that in domestic affairs, President Johnson is undoubtedly the most effective leader that I have served with. This is not because he has more compassion, not because he has more ability, more skill, well, it's in some respects skill, I suppose. He has been a leader of the Congress, perhaps the most effective majority leader the Senate ever had. Yes, he understands the role of the office of presidency, of the presidency. And he has lived up to the fullest expectations of the power and the prestige and the responsibility of that office. Now, we must look, I believe, briefly at what we could expect of the other candidate for president. For 12, year, for, four, for 12 years, I have served with him. I haven't voted for any Goldwater bills. I don't think I ever even had a chance to vote for a Goldwater amendment. At least I don't remember any that passed. But this isn't to say that Senator Goldwater isn't a man of goodwill and a man of considerable ability. He is both. Moreover, he's a gentleman. By the best measurement of that term. So I do not come here to make any personal characterizations of Senator Goldwater, but I think we do have the duty and responsibility to examine his political philosophy in its maturing stage. In this upside-down world of Senator Goldwater, the way to strengthen our national defense is to repeal the draft and to reduce appropriations for the armed forces. The path to fiscal responsibility and a balanced budget is not one tax cut, but five, though he voted against one. The way to be far Social Security is to vote against it. In this weird world in which he temporarily lives, <laughs> rapidity of change is noticeable. <laughs> a few days ago I offered in the Senate a bill to establish a prepaid 
health insurance system for the old during through Social Security so that people in their working years could pay a small amount, four-tenths of one percent of payroll to lay up for that rainy day that may come to some of us, surely will come to some of us and may come to any of us after 65, after which the record shows the need for hospitalization is three times as great as before 65. Fortunately, the Senate passed it. Most of the Senate voted for it, but not Senator Goldwater. And then he came to my state and accused me of having callous disregard for the old people of the country <laughs> because I'd offered this bill. Now let me ask you, who has callous disregard? One who tries to find and propose sound and effective and successful solutions to the pressing problems of the people? Or one who offers no solution whatsoever himself and votes against everything anybody else offers? In the conscience of this conservative, <laughs> the way to be secure, ruggedly self-reliant and self-made is to inherit a department store. <clears throat> One could relax and enjoy this campaign as a comedy of errors. <laughs> Were it not for the fact that a goodly number of our fellow citizens, let us face it, are entranced by this weird thinking man. I think in these dangerous days, what we need most of all is to have a President of the United States who is a safe guardian as Commander-in-Chief, a safe leader in the field of world affairs, a sound leader on domestic affairs. Lyndon Baines Johnson is such a man Barry Goldwater is not. One of the principal reasons why Senator Goldwater should not be chosen as President of the United States, in my view, is that his philosophy is not yet matured. We take some encouragement that it's changing Not by the season, but by the hour. <laughs> I'm awfully glad that Senator Mont is here to explain what Senator Goldwater's current position is on a number of issues. <laughs> I'm glad... In fact, I'm going to suggest him as chairman of the explanation squad. <laughs> <clears throat> Senator Goldwater seems to think that the prudent way to guard against an intended or unintended outbreak of nuclear warfare is to delegate the power to loose nuclear weapons to some general or admiral, unnamed and unknown. President Johnson says, and I firmly believe that the power to unloose this terrible weapon of destruction ought to remain, and if he's president, will remain the prerogative of the President of the United States. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator. And now it's my privilege to present, speaking for Barry Goldwater, Senator Carl Munt. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, my good friend Senator Albert Gore, and fellow Americans all. Like Al, I'm surprised and pleased to find such a wonderful attendance of dedicated and earnest young Americans taking time out during the noon hour to listen to a political debate. This is a most encouraging sign. I know it could never have happened in the college generation to which I belong. And up until today, I had always assumed that the United States Senate was the only sadistic institution in the world that goes to work at high noon. <laughs> we start, as you know, cold on the hour of 12, and I'm perfectly confident that the first senator, whoever he was, had ulcers or an indigestion of some kind and didn't care to eat, so he started at 12 and precedent governs the body. Even gotten out here in California now for the student noon hour. Like Albert, I have served with both of the candidates for president, call them my friend, have known them well, respect them as individuals, and do not intend to engage in any snide personalities or criticisms about them. <clears throat> if there is to be discussions about extremism in the campaign, they are not going to come from Senator Gore or from Senator Munt. By the way, I heard a definition of an extremist the other day that I kind of liked. Said an extremist is a fella who thinks there ought to be two television stations in Austin, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads me to say that if we're going to have to choose between a fella who made his money by inheriting a department store and one who made his fortune by opera operating a monopolistic television enterprise, I'll take the storekeeper every time. <laughs> That's private enterprise. But we are here confronted, as Al pointed out, with a serious decision. As a matter of fact, that's why you're attending this great university. Tremendous institution of learning. You're here in the process of deciding, and most of you, I presume, have not yet decided what you want to do with your life. But you come in the realization that whatever that decision ultimately is, you need training and background and information and consequently, you're attending this great institution. Now, likewise, in this decision we make on November 3rd, those of you who are old enough to vote and those who are not, who are interested enough to campaign for your favorite candidate, take part in a great decision because we're trying to decide as a great American republic which type of government and what kind of country we want in order to practice these careers which bring you here to this university to get yourself prepared to follow in later life. And I think basically and fundamentally on the domestic scene, the issue can be defined in one word. It's the issue of freedom. Our democratic orators and republican orators in a campaign talk about freedom. All of us would deny vehemently that we're against, as we deny we're against poverty, we're against the various problems that confront the folks. We don't want people to be ill, we don't want people to be poor, we don't want people to be unemployed. No candidate for office favors that. Any more than a candidate for office would run on a platform favoring war. But there's a difference in this campaign, and it's the biggest difference confronting the American electorate in three decades as to how you're going to conduct this thing called... I stand with Barry Goldwater and the traditional position of the Republican Party believing that freedom is something to be expanded for you and the individual and the ordinary citizen. And that what we should do is to increase the areas of your self-determination and free choice. The areas by which as free individuals you decide for yourselves what you intend to do and by and large, you succeed or fail in conformity with your ability and your integrity, your energy, 
and that degree of good luck which all of us have to have in order to succeed. But by and large, good luck and bad divides up between individuals. Each of us have our sunshine and our rain. What we need to do is decide, are we interested in maintaining and expanding a country dedicated to the concept that free people operating their own activities, their own businesses, their own professions, their own farms, and their own industries have the capacity in the future to do what free men in this country have done in the last century and three quarters, to build up a country, to build up a society so great, so successful, providing so much happiness for so many that no other country in the history of the world and no other system has come close to equaling it. Now Barry Goldwater throughout his philosophy believes in the individual and expanding his freedom and in placing confidence in his judgment. Now increasingly, down through the last several administrations where we have had democratic presidents, they have moved in a different direction of freedom. They also believe in freedom. But they believe, and LBJ believes even more than some of his predecessors, that freedom is something which should be expanded for the politician in the federal city of the land. That you should develop concepts whereby when people have problems, politicians will solve them. Of course, they'll take the money from the people with which to solve them. Or they'll borrow the money from the people's grandchildren with which to pay for them. And they'll shove people around, but with the best of intentions. This new concept that all the good emanates from the center is dedicated to the proposition that freedom of action and freedom of choice and freedom of operation, the freedom to get more of your money in taxes or to take it from you in inflationary deceit, freedom to encroach into your affairs and to intrude into your lives. This is something which should be expanded, but for the politician down in Washington. And usually the politician in the executive branch of the government. And so I think fundamentally that's something that you've got to decide. And there are good Americans, not fascists or communists, not extremists, good Americans on both sides of this issue. And I suspect for a time we're going to progress no matter what happens. But I put my faith and my confidence completely and totally in a system that has worked so well, no one else has ever been able to even approach what we provide in terms of opportunity and human happiness for the citizens of this country. And we did it down through the years by having faith in the people by creating a stable society in which people could follow their own judgment, rather than in trying to solve everything from the center down in Washington. All over the world we're hammering out this same decision. It isn't just an American decision. The developing countries in Africa, the countries of Asia, in Europe, the old countries of the world are all still struggling with today's big challenge to freedom, and I can say it in three words. What challenges your chances for success? Your chances to attain the degrees of accomplishment that your fathers and your mothers and your grandparents and your neighbors and your predecessors have achieved comes from the challenge of TMG, too much government, carried to its success in the excessive degree like they had in Nazi Germany, like they have in communist Russia, like they have in China, carried to its ultimate degree, it means one man decides everything for everybody. He has the great ultimate freedom. We're at the other end of the spectrum where we place the maximum degree of confidence in the people. Let me give you a do-it-yourself quiz show that you can test out. Go back and read the platforms and the promises made at the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City. If you can call it a convention that didn't have a roll call, no delegate ever got a chance to say anything. It was kind of a marionette show, I think. The only delegate accounted was at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue who didn't get to Atlantic City till the third day of the convention. But read what they come up with. I defy you to find a single suggested proposal 
which if you analyze it honestly, get away from partisanship, get away from the propaganda of the press, take those proposals, take those promises, take those programs, analyze them, what do you find? In each case, they give some federal politician in the central city, Washington, D.C., a little bit more authority, a new program to administer, a new chance to move into your profession, a new right to intrude into your private affairs. And without exception, they would take from you some of the funds which are rightfully yours and spend them as public dollars instead of private dollars. Now, some of you may want that. Because there are always people in every society, and I don't criticize them, who are more interested in security and stability and human safety than they are in the adventuresome American concept of an opportunity state. I happen to believe in the opportunity state. I believe in the thrill of adventure. I believe that that is a thing that makes us supreme in a world where too much government for too long has brought too much unhappiness to far too many people. But when you give politicians like Albert and me, and you can vote for but a very few of them, increasingly the right to tell you what to do and what you can do and when you can do it and under what terms and under what regulations, you're moving away from something highly important in the building of this country. The establishment of endless controls and regulations and centralized planning to meet all the problems of humanity, collecting the money for the people and saying, we think there are things that you ought to have, but you're too dumb to know that you need, so we'll take your money and get them for you. They're not spending their money, they're spending your money. This isn't a great group of philanthropists writing checks on their own bank account to be helpful to people. This is a group of do-gooders who believe that they know better than you know what is necessary for you. And they've got to do it with your money and your borrowed funds because there are other, no other funds available. I think it's brought out pretty well by the differences between Albert and me, between Goldwater and Albert on the whole Social Security program. I voted against the bill that Al brought up. I respect his sincerity. He's trying to do something for the old people. So am I. I voted for an alternative plan and so did Barry Goldwater. I voted for a program in this session of Congress also, and so did Barry Goldwater, that would say we're going to increase the returns to the Social Security clients of this country. We're going to give them more money at the end of the road than the bill had originally provided for. Now, what basically is the difference between the Gore plan and the philosophy of Barry Goldwater and Carl Munt and the Republican Party? Basically, the difference is this. We trust the people, you see. We say we have a responsibility when they get old to give them some additional returns so we're going to increase what they get from Social Security. Says the other fellow, we think that they ought to take part of that money that is going to be made available to them out of taxes which they pay, mind you. We think we should take part of that money and tell them that you have to buy an insurance policy. And you've got to buy a specific insurance policy determined by the government to meet so certain health problems which you may or may not have in old age. That's the basic difference. The tax is compulsory in both cases. But after collecting the tax and compiling the money, it comes time to distribute it. I believe with the Republican philosophy the people of America are smart enough to spend their own security stipends. They don't have to be told by a politician how to spend it. Some of them want to buy perhaps some term life insurance. Others want to buy health insurance. Others want to buy accident insurance. Why should a politician, Albert Gore or Carl Munt or Lyndon Johnson or anybody else, tell Americans what they have to do with their money unless you've lost confidence in the people, which is always one of the manifestations of too much government. It's something to ponder over. Not arguing that that is a wicked and iniquitous philosophy of government. I'm just saying it's not my style. It's not the style, I think, that built America. It's not the type, I think, that we should have. And I'm proud of the fact that we have in Barry Goldwater a man dedicated to a continuation and an expansion of a government getting its strength and suggestions from the people and dedicated to their concepts and not one to tell them what they have to do and arrange for them their lives. 
and make for them their plans. Now on the matter of foreign policy, Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater are equally dedicated to peace. You hear a lot of sophisticated nonsense about you wondering about which one of them can best be trusted to push the atomic button. Let me tell you something. Neither Lyndon Johnson nor Barry Goldwater nor any other American president is going to push an atomic button launching this country in the war. The people wouldn't stand for it. The Congress wouldn't stand for it. <laughs> the whole Christian philosophy in which we are dedicated is opposed to it. To go and launch an atomic war by pushing a button against people and destroying hundreds of millions of human lives and a murderous assault is out of character with America. Unfortunately, the communists know that. It's the only advantage they have over us in this whole scheme of things. They know that if comes an atomic war, they're going to shoot first. And this is a serious advantage that they have because they're men without conscience. They're God-hating, defying individuals. And as a consequence, if it serves their own notice, when it serves their own notice, they will launch an attack by surprise against us. Now, what we ought to be thinking about as Americans is which candidate is most likely to restrain and restrict an impulsive communist from launching an atomic war? Because it's not going to be launched by us. I urge you to meditate about that, to think which philosophy, which posture, which position, which party is most likely to do that. I suppose the best place you can go is to your history books on that one. Because since 1900, the beginning of the 20th century, we have had Republican and Democratic administrations equally about half the time. And since then, we have had three big wars and two little wars. And not Carl Munter, a Republican spokesman, tells you the record, but your history books and your own good judgment. Never under a Republican president since the beginning of the century has this country gotten itself involved in a war. Not once. And there's got to be a reason for that. Those things are not by accident. Just as there has to be a reason, and I don't know what it is. I'm a charitable fellow and say it's just bad luck. It may be bad judgment. It may be bad planning. I know it's not bad intentions, but whatever it is, we haven't had a Democratic president since the turn of the century who has served in office as long as three years without finding the country involved in a great big shooting foreign war. Now, you can argue with history, but you can't erase the facts. You can tear the pages out of the book, but it doesn't change the record. There it is. It seems to me if my wife were suffering and needed an operation, and I lived in a little town where there were only two doctors and I had to look at the record to see which doctor had the better chance of succeeding with the operation. And one of the doctors had performed a series of appendectomies and the patients had always died. And the other one had conducted a similar series of operations and the patient had always lived. That if I loved my wife, I'd vote for the winner who succeeded in maintaining life and maintaining peace. So think it out for yourself, because that's why you're here to think. And if you do, I'm convinced you'll come up with a conclusion. Millions of additional Americans are reaching every week. Barry Goldwater is America's best choice in 64. We'll pause for about two or three minutes to let you get to your one o'clock classes. And those who can remain, we'll have two rebuttals and we'll take questions from the audience. I think we can begin now, if those of you who can stay for two short rebuttals and then to ask questions from yourselves, will be seated. And we'll have the same order of speakers. And so I present to you for the second time, Senator Albert Gore speaking for President Johnson. I think that the presentations that you have heard fairly typify the campaign. 
most of us are looking to the future, are feeling fine, but Senator Munt and Senator Goldwater keep telling us we're sick. Most of us want to look to the future, make progress, <coughs> undertake to use the power of the people's government, which is an instrument of, by, and for the people, to find solutions to our pressing social needs, but not Senator Goldwater or Senator Munt. They tell us to look back to the good old days. Well, I'm not sure they ever really existed as good as a lot of people think they were. I prefer what tomorrow is going to be like over what yesterday was. And I think most Americans do. There's a general undertone in this campaign that there's some government, popular government though it is, there's something almost subversive about those people in Washington who want to build a stronger security, more security in our society. There's, what is this about freedom? I thought we all accepted that as the keystone of the arc of American system of government. But ladies and gentlemen, the fact that we have federal aid for the superhighway program of which I was co-author doesn't mean that we have less freedom to travel. It means that we can travel in greater comfort and safety, increasing the commerce and the prosperity of our society. This campaign offers a choice between prudent leadership the leadership of a man who knows what he means and says what he means and means what he says and is firm and safe in leadership, tested, tried, and true. I humbly suggest to you that I wouldn't be campaigning day and night in this campaign as vigorously as I am if I did not think that the election of Lyndon Baines Johnson over Senator Goldwater is eminently, unquestionably in the best interest of this country and not only this country but of the free world. Now there's one other thing I wish to suggest to you in this five-minute rebuttal. Not only do I suggest to you that President Johnson holds superior qualifications and demonstrated fitness for the office, the high office of president, but I suggest to you also that Senator Hubert H. Humphrey is eminently to be preferred for vice president and possibly to succeed to the presidency over Congressman William Miller. Thank you. And speaking again for Barry Goldwater, Senator Carl Munt. There's nothing really new about this question as to how much freedom you want to give your government. Albert has indicated this is something kind of new. It's being dramatized and spelt out in specifics in this campaign. But you know who the first president was who warned us against letting politicians like Gore and Munt and Lyndon Johnson or Barry Goldwater or any other politician exercise too many of your freedoms? There's a great fellow from down on the Potomac River by the name of George Washington. And he said in a, an address which all of you have read, 
And remember, and I don't think I'm quoting him word for word, but the substance is exactly that, and you can check it in your own library. George Washington said that government is like fire, a useful servant, but a dangerous master. That's why I oppose too much government, not because I distrust Lyndon Johnson as a man. I just don't think any man in America is good enough to start pushing people around because he's got too much authority. And if he's got it, he has to exercise it, has to utilize it, because that's the purpose of it. And so when we talk about the keystone of freedom, I refer to the individual. I think that's where it belongs. And you can't give government more authority out of a vacuum. It's got to come from you and me. And if you really feel that fellows like us are so erudite and so ethical and so all-embracing that we should make most of your decisions and determine them, very well. If you don't, you're going to have to work and work hard to defeat a government already growing so large that its power of propaganda and its power of the purse and its prestige is such that men like me are kind of stupid to go around, running the risk of all the recriminations that big government can provide because we defy it and challenge it and urge people to take it back. Big government simply cannot work. It hasn't worked in any country of the world where it's been tried, it's always failed. It's reduced people to slavery or taken them through this shambles of war. Big government in this country has been tried to its logical extent in one place only. That's in the operation of the post office department. Now, wouldn't you think if you were a young business graduate of UCLA, that if you could get the post office department and have a monopoly on selling stamps, it ought to be a pretty good business? Nobody can compete with you. You set your own prices. You set your own terms of delivery. Nobody can even make a stamp of his own because if he does, you put him in jail for counterfeiting it. What happens to the post office department? It goes into the red hundreds of millions of dollars every year because two months government cannot be operated efficiently without the whiplash of a dictatorship. And this in our country we wouldn't stand without some kind of revolutionary war. I guarantee you that if they'd sell the post office department to J.C. Penney tomorrow, he'd be making a profit on it before Christmas <laughs> because he'd operate it in a business capacity. And the employees would be happier. And I don't favor doing it. I don't want to be misquoted in the Bruin. <laughs> <laughs> They've already got me voting for the poverty bill and I voted against it, so I want to keep the record straight. <laughs> I don't favor selling it. I think we ought to keep it primarily to hold up in front of all Americans a horrible example of what too much government means. It's cheap tuition as a lesson towards good government. And I think we ought to maintain it. And we ought to continue it. So here we have men who are e evil men. They're not imprudent men. They're not impetuous men. Of course they change their mind. Albert's disturbed because Barry Goldwater has changed his mind. Great jumping Aunt Nellie. Let me tell you how Lyndon Johnson's changed his mind. He voted 12 times against civil rights. And then he voted for it and suggested a bill for it and brought one up for which I voted in his last campaign. He changed his mind. Barry Goldwater voted against civil rights 10 times as often as Goldwater voted against them. Goldwater's voted for them 10 times oftener than Lyndon Johnson. They both changed their mind. Lyndon Johnson was the leader of a coalition in the Senate to which I belonged on the problems of tax depletion of oil. Now he changed his mind. He's on the other side. Is that bad? Is that why you're going to condemn a president or a candidate for president? Because he learns? Because he grows with experience? I don't criticize Lyndon Johnson because he changes his mind. But I shudder a bit about the paucity of argument they use against Goldwater when they say, well, he changes his mind. I'm glad that he does. I do. Gore does. We all do. I hope we learn something. I hope this institution changes some of your minds, gives you something new to think about, some new ideas. It's the great American way. And so I say not as a republic, because as far as I'm concerned, having served in Congress 26 years, 24 of them with the minority, the difficulties of responsibility of majority leadership are pretty serious. But I say this may be the last chance in your voting career 
when you can stop government from growing too tough and too strong and too big and give it back to the people. And I've got confidence in Americans generally that in the final analysis they'll do the right thing. And I know politicians generally well enough to know that the rules of the game too frequently call them to do the expedient thing. And when they have too much of your money and too much of your power and operate too many of your businesses and intrude too deeply in your professions, the thrill and the challenge and the adventure of a society dedicated to opportunity tends to disappear and we move too far, in my opinion, in the direction of the welfare state or the paternalistic state or the security state or the too much government states we find in so many areas of the world. Since I oppose that trend, as does Barry Goldwater, I recommend him again to you as your choice, November 3rd. Let me ask now for questions which would be directed to both speakers and which uh, are questions of an objective nature which both can answer. Uh, so do I see hands on questions for both speakers? Or is that impossible for you? <laughs> Over here. A qu one question that both could answer. Over here. Minnesota. Uh, do you want to begin, Senator Gore? Two minutes. <laughs> the the question asks for an opinion from each senator on uh, the late Senator Joseph McCarthy. It's an easy question for me to dial it on for some time because just last week I finished a book which I sent to the publisher on Joe McCarthy and his meaning. So I think I got Alan kind of an unfair advantage on that one. I've been doing research on it for two years. Let me say it in just one big South Dakota long for. I think Joe McCarthy was a patriotic American. I think Joe McCarthy abominated communism. I think he reflected in his public life, the fact that he was at one time an Irishman, a Catholic, a Marine, and a former professional prize fighter. His methods were a little bit rough, but his objectives were perfectly sound. The late Senator McCarthy is a departed soul I did not have the advantage which Senator Mott had of being close to him. First gentleman on the couch over here. I believe the question calls for an opinion from each senator on the welfare state pattern in the Scandinavian nations. The Scandinavian nations are doing fairly well with the American aid that we provide them from a private economy system. <laughs> I have visited in the Scandinavian countries They are a great progressive people. I'm not sure that all of their experiences are such that we can take wisdom from them, but some of them surely are. I strive for the welfare of my state and my country and I'm not one who thinks that welfare is a snide phrase or a serious indictment. I strive to promote the general welfare.
Joel. The question asks for an opinion from each senator on the polarization of the parties exemplified by Senator Thurmond's switch to the Republican Party, the polarization caused by this particular election campaign. For some 12 years, I have been speaking in every state of the union urging for some kind of a clarification of party posture on the theory that the average American voter who's not in politics doesn't have much of a choice in determining who the president of the United States is going to be. He votes only once every four years on the issue. His choice is unlimited to two. He may very well have not had anything to do with the selection of either candidate and obviously cannot have had anything to do with the selection of both of them. And I think when John American goes around waiting for that important first Tuesday after the first Monday in November every four years to help direct the destiny of his country, he's entitled to a choice. I'm delighted he's got it in this campaign, but it's the first one that we have had clear cut on issues in 30 years maybe longer than that. I do think that there should be a transmigration of political forces. I think there is something wrong with a political party which compels a citizen, in fact, to vote at one and the same time for Harry Byrd as a Democrat and Wayne Morse as a Democrat, who never vote together in the Senate on sub substantive matters. I think it's equally wrong to re compel a Republican and his vote to embrace, as it were, by one ballot, the activities and votes of Jake Javits of the state of New York and Everett Derrickson of the state of Illinois. I think you're entitled to some kind of choice. There should be a transmigration by all the standards of consistency. Derrickson and Byrd should belong to the same political party. And by all the standards of consistency, Javits and Morse should belong to the same political party. Now, this is an indication. Here comes a man like Strom Thurmond, a dedicated patriotic senator who feels he'll be happier with one party than the other, so he moves. Wayne Morse, a number of years ago, made a movement in the opposite direction. Behind them, I think there should be, and I think there is now undergoing, a great transmigration of forces from one party to the other, so that there'll be a clearer distinction, giving people a choice. And I think that is a step in the direction of placing more freedom in your hand. Because every time you get a bigger choice, you stand higher in America, and politicians stand a little shorter. And I like a country in which we don't have 10 and 12 foot politicians and four and five foot private citizens. I like to keep them on a par. there are unquestionably advantages and also disadvantages to the polarization of our parties into extremes. I rather agree with most of what Senator Mont has said here, however. Uh, because it is only through the operation of the two-party system that the great mass of our people are given a meaningful choice. Therefore, the parties uh, should have distinctive positions. Now, with respect uh, to the late Senator Thurman, I respect his integrity and his right of choice and being the extremist that he is in many respects, I think he's made a proper transmigration. Question from a gentleman in a brown suit back here, brown jacket, tan pants, that's you. question asks each senator to tell if there is a need for a balanced budget in the national economy 
If so, why? And if so, when? There's no question but what there is a need for it when we're over $300 billion in the red. And when the American dollar, with which Al Gore and I were paid when we took the oath of office as young congressmen in January 1939, had a purchasing value of 97 cents. And the same dollar with which we're paid now has a purchasing value of only 47 cents. You can realize what a staggering national debt does not only to the purchasing power of people who are well paid as senators are, but to the working families of this country and the average householder. You can't escape what occurs from the standpoint of federal expenditures. Either you have to tax people heavily enough to stay current, or you have to take in revenue from other sources so you stay in balance, or you borrow the money and increase inflationary pressures which decrease the purchasing power of the dollar, as has transpired in the comparatively small political lifetimes of Gore and of Munt. And it's still going down. Now you break that far enough, and I don't know, and I don't know who does know whether a 45 cent dollar is a danger point, or whether you ultimately get to a 43 cent dollar. I know that it doesn't have as far to go before it's useless as it has already dropped since Gore and Munt have been in the Congress of the United States. So we've got to balance the budget in some fashion. Now you say when? I think certainly the time to start that is in what the administration loudly proclaims as the most prosperous period of American history. If they can't do it then, they can't do it during a depression. If you can't do it now, you can't do it in the middle of a war. And if you don't do it at all, these tokens that you're paid, that you're educating yourselves to earn, become useless. This is one great position and stand that Goldwater takes on security. He wants the Social Security recipient to receive a dollar to spend as big as the dollar he puts in out of his paycheck every week to accumulate the fund. This is serious to all of us. We lose the medium of exchange. We're in trouble, and I think all of us can afford to tighten our belt, postpone doing some of the things which we'd like to see done, moving in the direction of a balanced budget. I don't think he can do it tomorrow. I don't think Goldwater would get it done in the first couple of years of his administration. But you've got to start moving in that direction. As long as we're headed up into the far blue yonder, four times since the election of Jack Kennedy, We've had to ask to increase the debt limit of this country. Sometime we're going to have to say, no, spend what you have. But don't ask us to borrow any more. That's as much in your interest as mine. Much more. You're younger. And it's the most interest of the youngest person here. Ask your fathers and mothers, who being good patriotic citizens I know, bought war bonds in World War II. Ask them to figure out with a stub lead pencil on the back of a playing card the purchasing power of that war bond now that it's matured as against the purchasing power of the dollars they spent to buy it. This is serious business, and we ought to be at it. The role of fiscal policy in our national economy is a subject that deserves much more attention than one can give it in a two-minute response to an important question. Suffice it to say that I'm one who believes and have long believed that there are times when we can well justify deficit expenditure. I'm not one who thinks that there are never times when we should have a balanced budget, just as I'm not one who thinks that we should have a balanced budget every year. Fiscal policy is an instrument of the government. It is an important regulator of our economy. Just now, we're in the longest sustained period of stable prices that I have known in my lifetime. 
I have disagreed with some of the fiscal policies of our government in the present administration and in the previous one. But it may, be, may have been that I was wrong and uh, the executive officials were right. Time, I guess, will tell. But just let me close by saying that I do believe that fiscal policy as well as monetary policy should be utilized to serve the public good. The government should exercise itself in all of the available machinery to see to it that we have a full employment economy and a society which is both affluent and compassionate. The uh, gentleman in the, the white shirt, dark hair, here. The question concerns the vote on the Civil Rights Bill. The questioner has stated that each senator voted contrary to the way the man he is supporting for the presidency voted or supported. And he asks each senator to explain, uh, presumably, his support of the candidate in view of their disagreement over the Civil Rights Bill. Senator Moore. You are a very astute young man, and you're exactly correct. You have observed something which many Americans have not noticed, but that is correct. Albert Gore voted against the uh, Civil Rights Bill, as did his candidate for president during his career in the Senate 12 different times, but Lyndon Johnson, give him credit now, was for this present Civil Rights Bill. I voted in favor of the Civil Rights Bill. Barry Goldwater, who had voted 10 or 12 times previously in favor of Civil Rights Bills, voted against this particular one. He, ha he may have voted against it for the same reasons that Albert Gore did. I'm perfectly frank to say it was a close decision in my mind, and I'm pretty sure it was a close decision in Albert's. This was not a question of all white and all black as far as the values and the virtues and the verities were concerned. This was a situation in which many of us wish we could have changed a couple of sections, and then we probably would have had almost a unanimous vote. Uh, I'm positive that both Barry Goldwater and Lyndon Johnson in the presidency will carry out a program in line with the enforcement of the Civil Rights Bill. I'm perfectly convinced in my mind that neither one of them is a racist or a bigot and that neither the earlier votes of Lyndon Johnson nor the last vote of Barry Goldwater is any basis on which you try to determine their character. You go back in their personal lives, and their personal attitudes, and their present attitudes, and I think you'd have to say that both of them are Americans who believe, as I do, and I'm sure as Albert Gore does, that there shouldn't be anything about race, color, or creed that determines whether a man can vote, or whether he's entitled to move around in our free society with all of the rights and privileges of any other individual. After all, the the old American doctrine, all men are created equal, and that is true. That's the only time we're equal in our whole lives. Five minutes after that, we begin deviating, and 50 years after that, there's no equality at all, because it depends on the personal attitudes and achievements of the individual. But I don't think it's a partisan issue in this campaign, because Al Gore wasn't the only Democrat who voted against it, and I certainly wasn't the only Republican that voted for it. It's a question of where you place the emphasis and what little particular sections of it you opposed, let me say in conclusion that on the record, Barry Goldwater has done more as an individual to bring about desegregation than either of the can other three top candidates running for office, either Hubert or Bill or Lyndon. As commander of the Arizona National Guard, he desegregated the guard there to be the first in the country so desegregated. 
As a member of the school board of the state of, fin of the city of Phoenix, Arizona, he introduced a resolution and had it adopted. And it became municipal policy to desegregate the school. As the owner and operator of a successful department store business, which is private enterprise, by the way, he desegregated his help and paid them on an equal basis quite regardless of color. So I don't think it should be a political issue. I neither commend nor condemn Goldwater nor Gore nor Johnson nor Munt for the position we took. It was a sticky question and each man, I think, made that decision in conformity with where he placed the emphasis and the dictates of an active conscience. Three civil rights bills have passed the United States Congress, and only three. In 1958, the first one, that is the first one since the Civil War period, passed. It passed under the leadership of our then majority leader, Senator Lyndon B. Johnson. I helped write it, and I voted for it. In 1960, <clears throat> we passed <clears throat> a second civil rights bill. Likewise, I voted for that one, and so did Senator Johnson. This one was a great deal more far-reaching. There was, I believe there were 14 titles in the bill, a very long, a very complicated, a very far-reaching piece of legislation. My state has made great progress, and its progress is difficult there. It was Nashville, Tennessee that started the one grade per year plan, and we're up now to the eighth grade this year. Some of the high schools are already integrated. Much progress, and we've done it with goodwill, <coughs> with hard work, mutual understanding and trust, with a minimum of uh, uh, the terrible violence, uh, incidents of violence that we've seen. The one provision that gave me the greatest trouble was the power to withhold or the power to threaten to withhold federal funds. This seemed to me an unnecessary power and not essential uh, to the principal civil rights for which I was willing to vote in the bill. And if, for instance, funds are withheld to Nashville, Tennessee, the schools of Nashville, Tennessee, which has not yet quite completed the job, because some discrimination still exists, what children will need the school lunch most? Unfortunately, the largest percentage of hungry children are Negro children. So, and this was a power which the late President Kennedy said he neither needed nor wanted. I tried every legislative means to try to strike that from the bell. Una being unable to do so, I had a judgment to exercise trying to represent the welfare of all the people of my state. It was a vexatious question. I chose to vote against the bill. Now as to the position of President Johnson, he strongly recommended the bill. Not only strongly recommended it, but exercised the full power of the office of president to secure its enactment. We have time for one more question, so uh, for the final question, uh, the gentleman in the second row here.
The I want to comment on that first. <laughs> well, let me repeat it. So okay. the, the question which uh, so exercises Senator Gore from Tennessee uh, concerns the TVA, and the gentleman wants a comment from each senator on the proposed sale of TVA to private enterprise. Well, you know, after this proposal to sell the TVA, even for one dollar, I was about to think that Senator Mont was going to suggest that we sell the post office department, but I'm glad he changed his mind on that before he finished. <laughs> uh, this is an unthinkable proposal. You don't sell a river. They tried to give it away with a Dixon Yates contract, not the river, but a large part of the service area of the TVA. Do you know what the estimated value of the TVA as a going utility is today? More than two billion dollars. Yet Senator Goldwater has repeatedly said that he wants to sell it even for one dollar. Be a pretty good bargain, wouldn't it? If it's going to be up, maybe some of us better get together and perform a transmigration ourselves. This is really unthinkable. TVA earns a net profit, earned a net profit last year to the government. It was paid into the Treasury of the United States of $55 million. Now, one of the responsibilities of the President of the United States is to be a husbandman of the resources of the country and the rights of the people. I simply think it is an irresponsible proposal to suggest the sale of the TVA, a going institution, the largest integrated utility in the world, earning a net profit of $55 million a year, even for $1. A man who makes such a foolish proposal as that really ought not be running for president. I think the young man in the second row did a good job of sort of bringing this thing back into balance because you recall Senator Gore pled noli contendere on the Joe McCarthy question because he said he hadn't had the intimate associations on which to make a judgment that I had had. So now you asked a question which you could say was right up his valley, if not his alley. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> certainly uh, that's as it should be. <laughs> and. Uh, I'm perfectly confident that if I lived in the valley, I'd be an advocate of the great advantages which TVA gives that area of the country, uh, just as he is. After all, we do represent our constituency and our people. And TVA really isn't in much competition with my state. It is in competition with yours, because I heard just up in Los Angeles yesterday, or in uh, San Francisco yesterday, where they have a lot of electronics installations in connection with Stanford University, of some of the transmigration of electronic plants down into the television to the TVA area because of the low cost of power which you and I help provide. Now I think you have to kind of keep things in balance and we have to keep in balance what Barry Goldwater said about TVA. He didn't say he was going to sell the whole operation. He said he was going to sell those aspects of it which had nothing to do with the original design. They operate a fertilizer plant down there for example which was never conceived of as part of the original concept of providing for the people of that area low-cost power in connection with the multipurpose dam. That is American standard operation. But I have a fertilizer plant operator in my state who's somewhat distressed about the fact that if this thing expands, it's kind of on a pilot plant demonstration, but if it continues, out of business go all the fertilizer plants in private. You can't compete with Uncle Sam. He gets you every time because he can lower the price and collect the deficits and so forth. I'm glad Barry Goldwater raised the question. I happen to be on the subcommittee of appropriations that appropriates vast sums of money for, tele for the TVA every year. 
it has problems that it has to meet. It's not just the easy going lucrative enterprise that you get because they pay back on the debts a certain amount of money every year. I don't think that any precipitate action should be taken, but I think there are aspects of it which might well be sold back to private enterprise so they can start paying a tax to help meet this big budget we were talking about and to put it in balance and pay the debt. And that when you have too many little socialistic enterprises operating and let them go too far, what you have then is not a transmigration of political forces, but you have a transmigration of the tax burden from government institutions which don't pay them to the backs of you and me who have to pay them. And as youngsters, you start out in life with an income tax of 20 to 25 percent of what you make at the very beginning. When I started out in life, graduating from Carleton College, no income tax at all. So I had a 25 percent advantage right there, and it's gotten bigger. Let me say this, since it is the last question, that you've been a wonderful audience. My goodness, I just can't understand you staying here in the middle of the day. I, I salute you, everyone. You've been a most respectful audience. Doesn't bother a fellow from Rattlesnake Country out in South Dakota to hear a hiss now and then. It makes him feel at home. That doesn't bother me at all. But by and large, you've been a, a, a wonderful audience. And I know that I speak for Albert Gore and Carl Munt both in saying it's been a real thrilling experience for us to be here in this wonderful institution on this great campus, taking part in the American exercise of self-determination and free choice. Thank you.